How many of you have been, seems like a self-serving question, but I'm truly really interested, you've been enjoying or appreciating the, uh, the Love Rain Wed series, and now that we're in the Sermon on the Hill, to just the very teachings of Jesus, and how uh, Jesus being Jewish, how that affects our understanding of the, uh, the Sermon on the Hill. I certainly have uh, appreciated myself um, the opportunity to study it each week and then impart it to you. And so we are still there. Um, and we're in the heart of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount again today. Yes. And Matthew chapter 7, we're just taking as it unfolds. And here's one of the most familiar scriptures uh, that we draw from in the Sermon on the Hill. Beginning at Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, the door will be opened. These are the red letters of Jesus. Jesus is quoted as saying these very words. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? And if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in Heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law of the prophets. So there you have it. This is clearly a passage on prayer, right? Ask and you will receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Matthew chapter 7. But again, I've been trying to help you understand that our instinct in understanding the scriptures, where it might be through a Canadian filter, an English filter, sometimes misleads us. Because Jesus was Jewish. He lived in a Jewish culture. Jesus was a rabbi, a teacher, who thought and taught like a Jewish rabbi. And if you forget that, then you run the risk of misunderstanding his words and certainly missing the fullness of what he is saying. So, for example, we take notice of verse 11. We'll go to the next slide there, Doug. And there's this expression, how much more? Did you hear that when I read it to you? If you being evil know how to give gifts to your children, how much more our Father who is good will give gifts to you? This expression, how much more, is a, an example of rabbinic reasoning. It's called a kal val homer. Kal val homer. Literally meaning light and heavy. Now it's the use of a dramatic comparison, often irony, for the sake of making a point. And Jesus in this case takes that of a wicked person, a wicked man, and still his love for his children in terms of generous gift giving. We know that as we watch um, even television, pro television programs on the Mafia or whatever. They're very devoted to their family. And though they are wicked in terms of how they treat other people, in terms of their treatment towards their own family, very generous and overflowing. But Jesus compares that of a wicked father who is generous to his own children to the best father in the world, our Father which art in heaven. And the point is taken, how much more, Jesus says, how much more will Father God respond to us when we take our request to Him? Because God is not evil, He is good. Now we can track with that. That makes sense. But that's a term often used in Scripture, and it's actually a form of rabbinic reasoning. Now in Luke chapter 18, the same technique is used. Jesus tells this parable, this story of a woman who's desperate. She's been abused. She's been mistreated somehow. And so she, she takes her case to a judge. Now the judge back then is um, called a shofet. And, and a shofet is someone who is obligated to show justice to those who have been wounded. He needs to vindicate those who have been wronged. But in this case of the parable, the judge, the shofet, is wicked. And he doesn't want anything to do with this woman, even though she's been abused and mistreated. So, it's injustice upon injustice for her. But in the parable, Luke 18, Jesus says that this woman will not relent. She persists. She starts badgering him. 
she won't go away until he finally pulls out his hair and he's almost as bald as me. And he says, oh, I can't take it anymore. And so he finally serves this lady up the justice that she needs because she persists for him. And then Jesus adds in red letters, and will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? No, I tell you, he will see that they get justice and, and that quickly. It's that how much more, that light and heavy. If God, or if an evil father will give good gifts to his children, and a wicked judge will eventually, if, if, if badgered, give justice to this lady, how much more will God, who is good, give good gifts and justice? Right on. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's a comparison. Because God is good. But that's not the end of it. I love the Bible. And I love understanding it through the eyes of a Jewish rabbi. Chutzpah. You ever heard that one before? How many of you have some chutzpah? I'm Canadian, eh? All the way. All the way. Most of you were born and raised in Canada, eh? Susie and I were on holidays in the Caribbean. And uh, a lady bumped into me. And I said, oh, sorry. She goes, you're from Canada, aren't you? I said, how did you know that? She goes, I bumped into you and you apologized. You're from Canada, aren't you? I went, yeah, I am. Sorry. <laughs> Most of us Canadians are apologetic, we're timid and polite. I said most of us Canadians. I know a few that, yeah. yeah. So when I read these words and stories by Jesus on prayer, I kind of sigh with a little bit of relief. Because unlike the lady who, who badgered the unjust judge to get justice, I don't have to badger God. Because he is, he's good, he's just. And like the evil dad who was inclined to still inclined to give good gifts to his children, I don't have to beg God because he is inherently unlike that father. He's good. Ask and it will be given to you. I just have to ask once. Seek and you will find. I just need to look once. Knock and the door will be opened. I don't have to be a Sheldon. Penny. Penny. I just knock, and the door will be opened. That's what the Bible says. And all of this is true, but we've got to remember this. No, don't forget this, that Jesus was not Canadian. He wasn't English. He was, he was Jewish. And he thought and he taught like a Jewish rabbi. And it would seem that Jesus liked a little chutzpah from time to time. From a Jewish perspective, an intimate relationship with God didn't necessarily have to look like a Canadian's relationship with God. It didn't have to appear polite as far as perceptions were concerned. It could be tenacious. It could be, it could be tenacious to the point of being a little pushy at times. For that is the Jewish culture. And that is why Jesus embedded into his parable a persistent widow. A lady who would not give up. She wouldn't let the issue go. Now we could say that there's no need for us to be persistent because God is good. And that's true. But a Jewish person would say, we should be persistent because God is good. Just a different way of looking at it. I like this story. Lois Verber tells of an incident when she was riding a bus in Jerusalem. Some of us have been in Jerusalem. It's a mosaic of Jewish people from every part of the world. Remember, they were uh, basically sent away from their country due to all the, the occupant, occupations and uh, being conquered. But over time, they begin to migrate back. But they're from all over the world. But on this one day, a gray-haired matronly retiree climbed aboard and plunked herself in a seat halfway back on a bus. 
And the point is, is that she didn't pay the fare. She walked right past the driver, right past the coin deposit, or the token deposit, and she sat halfway back in the bus, insolent. That's chutzpah. The driver looked in the mirror and he shouted, I forgot it! Where to, ma'am? She pretended not to hear. So he shouted again, I forgot it! Where to, ma'am? Finally, she barked back a gruff response, completely brazen and impenitent, but the driver was not done. There was a flurry of Hebrew which nobody could understand, but the gist of which was either buy a ticket or get off the bus. But the woman had chutzpah. She just sat there, immovable, adamant. She remained glued to her seat. So, the driver threw up his hands in disgust. It's the universal expression of Jewish people for being exacerbated and annoyed. And on that afternoon, chutzpah met chutzpah. He put the bus into park even though it was on a main artery with only one lane free for the flow of traffic. And he sat there, he snapped open the newspaper and began to read the headlines. <laughs> for blocks, traffic started to back up, honking and yelling and all sorts of stuff, but there he remained. Now that's what you call chutzpah. It's the utter audacity. It's pushing one's purpose. Or pushing boundaries for the sake of one's purpose. So eventually, the old woman rose from her seat, unapologetic, shuffled off the bus. And if you lived in the first century and walked with Jesus and listened to Jesus and lived in the culture that he lived, you would be familiar with this kind of behavior. It's chutzpah. It's brazen. It's brash. It's... I dare you. And while Jesus' teaching on the one hand highlights the character of God as being a good father and a good judge in contrast to those same people that might be evil, he is also making room for some chutzpah in our relationship with God. Now there's nothing wrong with us being Canadian. It's simply who we are. It's nothing wrong with trusting God upon first request because I'm not the kind of person that will badger anyone, let alone God. I mention my request to God and I leave it there. But neither is there anything wrong with a little chutzpah in our prayer life. And Abraham, if you go back to the, the ancient scriptures in Genesis, he set the tone. He heard God condemn Sodom with the plan to wipe Sodom, the city of Sodom, off the face of the earth. But Abraham had some concerns with God's plan. And he approached God with a little chutzpah. He had the nerve to begin to bargain with God. He said in verse 23 of Genesis 18, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it, God, from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And so like a savvy Arab merchant, Abram haggles over God, or with God, over the city. What if there's 50 righteous? And then he says, what if there's 40? And God says, okay, for 40. What if there's 30? What if there's 20? And God says, okay, if there's 20. What if there's 10? And each time God agrees. But as we read this, from our, our vantage point, we would see that Abraham is being a little irreverent. How dare you question God? How, who do you think you are? How dare you try to haggle God down to something that you're comfortable with? He should have just accepted God's plan at face value, right? That would have been trust. But what we don't realize from a Jewish framework, conversing with God and coming to terms with God is also prayer. It's a sign of trust. It's like a little boy who keeps or a little girl who keeps tugging on daddy's shirt and pestering, knows that ultimately that daddy has a soft heart and might eventually give in without consequence. There's nothing to be lost. 
Back to the Fiddler on the Roof. Remember that movie? Tevye, a Jewish father, he has conversations with God that seem completely irreverent to us. His mule has just injured his foot, and Tevye looks to heaven and begins to talk to God. Dear God, was that necessary? Did you have to make him lame just before the Sabbath? That wasn't nice. It's enough for you to pick on me, bless me with five daughters, a life of poverty, that's all right. But what have you got against my mule? Really, sometimes I think, when things are quiet up there, you say to yourself, let's see, what kind of mischief can I play on my little friend, have you? And we go, ah, I can't talk to God like that. But you're not Jewish. There's allowance for a good spot. hundred years before Jesus was born, there was this man, his name was Tony, and he had this reputation of being an incredible prayer person. He had a wonderful prayer relationship with God. But everyone was suffering an incredible drought, and so they begged Tony to pray for rain. And so at first when Tony prayed for rain, no rain fell. Tony, not to be defeated, decided that he would do something more. He went outside and he drew a circle. And he stood in the circle. And he said, I'm not moving from here, God, until you take pity on your people. It began to rain drop by drop. Unsatisfied, Honey said, that's not what I wanted, but I wanted rain for filling up cisterns, pits, and caverns. And then it began to rain violently. So Honey prayed yet again, this is not what I wanted, but rain of goodwill, blessing, and graciousness. And the sky settled down, and just a nice rain began to nourish the crops and restore the land. Now, I don't know how much of that story is true, but it makes a point from a Jewish perspective. Prayer with God can include some brashness. In addition to the brazen bargaining of Abraham, we have buried in the Old Testament, Jacob, who refused to let go of the angel of the Lord, which is... Basically, Jesus, in the Old Testament, you have King David's laments, how long, O Lord, and Job's, Job's complaints. It, it becomes apparent to us that God isn't just interested in us praying to Him. He's interested in us being transparent, just being real, demonstrating real honesty. And how can we tell if our <coughs> prayers are appropriate? Rabbi Abraham Heschel makes this statement. The issue of prayer is not prayer. The issue of prayer is God. And how you pray reveals what you think about God. For me, ask, that is enough. I trust God. That's okay. From a Jewish perspective, It reveals that they trust God too. And that's okay. You see? It's about God. And God is good. So we fall back to Matthew 7, verse 7, and the red letters of Jesus. Ask, seek, knock. There seems to be embedded in that verse a rising scale of intensity. Asking is simply putting forth a simple request. Lord, I need improved help. Seeking is asking Plus acting, isn't it? It's doing something more. In other words, put some effort to make yourself better. Take some vitamins, go to the doctor, do what you need to do that way. And knocking suggests asking and seeking. And keep asking, and keep seeking, and keep asking, and keep seeking until the door is open. But the point of it is, it doesn't matter where you are on that scale, because if you ask, we're told that we receive. If you seek, we're told that we will find. If you knock, we're told that the door will be opened. It's not about how you pray. It's about that you do pray. And the way you pray reveals the measure of your trust in God. And in all levels, it shows trust in God. Well, let me close with this. In 2009, two burglars broke into a home. 
and they were stuffing their sacks or whatever they had to walk away with all the valuables. It was a, a male and a female that had broken into this home. And while they were robbing the place and they went to lift up the laptop, they made a shocking discovery. This is a true story. The person they were robbing, they discovered, was a pedophile. The laptop they stole contained 78 illegal images, all involving minors. So now the burglars are faced with a serious dilemma. Do they contact the police and face arrest themselves? Or do they turn a blind eye to the images they saw and let this person continue harming minors? The person's name was Mr. Cloverdale, Richard Cloverdale. And the burglars decided to turn the laptop over to the police. And Mr. Cloverdale, as a result, was sentenced to three and a half years in prison for his crimes of pornography involving children. And the unnamed burglars were given 12 months community service. Jesus would say, if criminals can do the right thing, how much more God, who isn't a criminal, will do the right thing. And while the hell's angels have this notorious reputation for being bullies and, and for doing all sorts of things that are of... Uh, filled with injustice and, and, and violence. During the Black Friday sales in 2014, members waited in line at Walmart for five do days in order to make a purchase. And once inside, they purchased every single children's bicycle in that store, 200 of them. And then they donated them to the Provello House, an organization in California that helps the needy. And Jesus would say, if the hell's angels have margin in their heart, to do kindness for children, how much more will your Father in Heaven, who is inherently good, treat you? So remember this year, as you go into 2016, to ask, and to seek, and to knock. If you need a little spot to demonstrate your faith to God, then so be it. God can handle it. The point is, it's not about the prayer, it's about God, and that you do pray. Are you with me? God hears. How much more? How much more? Heavenly Father, we draw again from Jesus' Sermon on the Hill and we're reminded to pray and to pray from a whole heart. God, help us in this coming year with the battles that we're fighting, the mountains that need to be moved, and the pain that is embedded in our hearts that needs to be healed. God, help us to ask, and if necessary, to seek, and if necessary, to knock. Help us to, to pray until we are the people that we want to be before you as we express our trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Amen.